Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I would also like to reiterate uh, a warm welcome to the 25th year anniversary uh, conference for the PhD Foundation. And we're really delighted that you've taken time out of your busy schedules to join us in person. Um, it's still a novelty post-pandemic, so we're delighted to see you all. And ahead of the excellent program of presentations and various topics and discussions we're going to have later, I would like to take this opportunity to provide you with a summary of what the PhD Foundation has been doing over the last five years. So before I start, for those who don't know us that well, uh, the PhD Foundation is a health policy think tank focused on genomics and related technologies and how they can be used for better, more personalized healthcare. We were established in 1997, and in April 2018, we became a linked exempt charity of the University of Cambridge. We are funded by philanthropic grants, academic grants, and commissioned work. Uh, we're based in this lovely building, as you can see. It's called Strange Ways Research Laboratory. There's a long history, don't ask. Um, and it's based across from Addenbrooke's Hospital and is very close to the biomedical campus, which is perfect uh, for our work. And I should say that we've been based in this building ever since the beginning. So we've been there 25 years as well. So our vision. Uh, well, our vision is for a society that makes the best possible use of advances in life sciences to promote health and improve the prevention and treatment of disease by making responsible changes in health policy and the organization of health systems. We aim to do this by providing knowledge, evidence, tools, and opportunities to inform policy and decision makers. So I'm going to start in different categories of work that the foundation has undertaken over the last five years. First, I've described it as PhD-led. So this is uh, activities that we've done using our charitable fu uh, funds and for the purposes of our mission. And the first report that we produced in 2018 was regarding mainstreaming genomics. And we were investigating with clinical colleagues and laboratory scientists and commissioners and policymakers. We were investigating how and where genomic testing fits into the current pathway and how clinicians could use it. And we then followed that with a polygenic, our first report on polygenic scores, and we were focusing on cardiovascular disease in 2019. But that was also an important year because that was the conclusion of our foresight project, which was called My Healthy Future, which was a two-year project, and it examined the possible impacts of new and future science and technology over a sort of 20-year uh, forward view. It was very focused on personalized prevention and combined extensive research as well as a series of structure evidence-building workshops to consider the possible impacts of new and future technologies and science. And really the purpose of that was to sort of understand how these technologies could look like for the future of health and healthcare. And also to try and raise issues and considerations that policymakers may wish to consider now in order to realize the potential of these developments happening in 20 years time. And it was a very large piece of work. It had a suite of 20 documents and it concluded with the report here you see in orange, which is our healthy future. But also there was a range of other documents that presented research results and evidence and discussions, for example, on autonomy and also on overdiagnosis. And we were really, really grateful for the 80 experts and external participants that helped us with this research. So moving on, we also investigated citizen-generated data and what it could mean for health in 2020. We uh, investigated and undertook research with regards to the state of artificial intelligence for genomic medicine. We then also completed our second report on polygenic scores, and this time was very much focusing on what polygenic score applications, uh, what the clinical utility of these could be. Uh, in parallel, um, we investigated the changes that would be needed to implement and deliver polygenic scores within existing practice, and we used the NHS Health Check uh, program as an example. And then we also last year produced our, our latest report on polygenic scores for cancer. But that's not all. We have a range of different outputs. The examples I've given you just now are large programs of research that result in rather large documents or a suite of documents. But we're also very proud of our policy briefings. And they have been incredibly popular over the last seven or eight years. And 
In the last five years, we've produced 29. And these are four sides, very succinct, focused on a specific issue, uh, looking at considerations with regards to the questions being posed, and they look at key technologies, treatments, science, data, regulatory areas. They can be anything within our remit. Um, and like I said, they are very popular. We also have explainers, which are even higher level summaries. They're just one side, and believe you me, it is a very difficult thing to do to put one side of technology summary describing what it is, what it can do, and what it means for patients, and is it ready for patients. And we've done 18 of those. And more recently, we're really excited to have developed the capability to do podcasts, and we've already released three on ctDNA, xenotransplantation, precision medicine for inflammatory bowel disease. And I should emphasize that all our PhD-led work are freely available on our website. So further, while we also have another output which we call discussion papers, these are very detailed technical analyses and they're focused on regulatory matters, again, available from our website. We also respond to consultations. We feel that's a very important role for the foundation, you know, on appropriate topics and subjects. Um, but we also um, do a very large number of blogs, and we see that as a key kind of engagement with the community in terms of our team working very quickly, responding to key issues, either whether they're developments in policy, whether they're in science. And as you can see, the blogs, the team have done over 200 over the last five years. And we feel that that's very important in terms of what we do. Now, the foundation was also the secretariat for the all-party parliamentary group on personalized medicine between 2015 and 2020. And the foundation, through the group, supported a range of meetings on topics that included personalized medicine for lung cancer, the 100,000 Genomes Project, implementing the National Genomic Medicine Service, um, and also gene therapy in the NHS, just a few of the topics that we have covered. And as a foundation, we also find it a very successful approach to engaging with parliamentarians on a range of key topics in genomics and other innovations in healthcare. So moving on to our commission work, so particularly UK departments and agencies. So the first, uh, in 2018, we were commissioned by NHS England to undertake a research and a review of the personalized medicine technology landscape. We then worked with uh, PHE colleagues in the gastrointestinal bacteria reference unit to develop a pathogen genomics case study, which was really there to demonstrate the increasing clinical utility of pathogen genomics. We also received a grant from the Wellcome Trust to investigate black box medicine and transparency. And this research was really all about examining the human interpretability of machine learning in healthcare and research. Now, I should say, if anybody has any questions on this topic, there is a very good team called the Humanities Team who will be able to answer, because it was very complicated, but very, very fruitful research. Because the team, over one year of research involving lots of stakeholders and workshops, resulted in a series of very detailed documents, each examining a different aspect of human interpretability. And what the result was is six reports, six very detailed technical reports that are all linked, trying to answer a number of key issues and, and questions and challenges, particularly around effective regulatory oversight and for securing user and public trust. Again, those uh, reports are on our website as well. We were approached by the Information Commissioner's Office and we got a grant to investigate the impact of GDPR and Data Protection Act on regulating genomic technologies on healthcare. NHS Scotland, well, actually, specifically the National Services Scotland, approached us to update a report we had done for them in 2016 on clinical genomic analysis, uh, and we completed the update in 2020, and that was as part of their Genomic Laboratory Consortium review. The AHSN network also approached us following the report we did for NHS England and asked us to look into some more detail on a number of specific areas. And these were circulating tumor DNA, pharmacogenomics, transcriptomics, genetically modified regenerative medicines. And then also, during pandemic, we received a grant from the NIHR to investigate the regulation and use of confidential patient information for genomic me and medicine, medical research during and post-COVID-19. 
and, not surprisingly, National Services Scotland came back to us very quickly after our last report and asked us to do a further investigation regarding international models of service delivery for laboratory genomics. And we investigated the laboratory genomics situation in Norway, Finland and Belgium. And this was a truly fascinating and interesting insight into other systems and how they develop their genomics uh, laboratory services. Genomics England uh, approached us to uh, develop and consider an ethical and legal framework for Genomics England and Sano Genetics participant engagement platform in 2021. And we were also a member of the consortium with SQW investigating the Industrial Strategy Challenge Fund uh, precision medicine evaluation, and that's near completion in the next uh, few months. Uh, more recently, the Department of Health and Social Care commissioned us to provide a background document on polygenic scores for the equity and medical devices independent review. And even more recently, just hot off the press, we've been working with, well, we've been commissioned by the MHRA to undertake a regulatory review of synthetic health data. So, we also have key stakeholders in the academic community. We have, uh, we're members of consortiums and collaborations. First, in the last five-year period, is BCAST, which was uh, very much focused on breast cancer stratification. <coughs> and our team was very much exploring uh, the issues of personalizing breast cancer prevention and the, both the policy setting, but also what further evidence would be required in terms of research. We were a member of the EXACT consortium, which was very focused on the exchange of European staff focusing on integrating precision health in healthcare. And two members of our team benefited from the exchange. Saumi Morty undertook a placement with the European Public Health Association in Utrecht and also at Amsterdam University Medical Center. And Tanya Brigden took, undertook a placement with the Council of Canadian Academies in Ottawa. We also have a collaboration with the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at the Hong Kong University. And this is very kindly funded and, uh, by the Wing Foundation. And Colin Mitchell, our head of humanities, has undertaken a number of webinars on discussing regulatory topics. We're also a member of the Profit Consortium, which is a, a pan-European, uh, EU-funded project which aims to develop a personalized prevention roadmap for the future of healthcare. And we're uh, both a work package lead for that and contributing to the other work packages. More locally, we were delighted to be invited by the DIS Institute to join the Da Vinci study, where our humanities team undertook an ethical and legal analysis of the visual identifiers in the care of people with dementia. The same humanities team also uh, are members of the Delta Research Project, uh, which is investigating the, le and the humanities team uh, focus has been on investigating the legal, regulatory, ethical challenges associated with the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning in a prevention pathway using the cytosponge, and they've had to undertake at least four workshops as part of that research. And then we're also members of the Express Research Project, which is in a, uh, funded by the NIHR, and this is evaluating the NHS fetal exome sequencing service. Moving on to our international commissioned work. So FIND, which is the Global Alliance for Diagnostics, which is an NGO based in uh, Geneva, first approached us uh, to uh, undertake research in the, sp in the field of next generation sequencing for viral hemorrhagic fever. And we were about to start, or I think we had started, and then the pandemic occurred. And not surprisingly, FIND asked us very quickly to pivot and uh, investigate next generation sequencing for SARS-CoV-2. And the science team worked incredibly hard over an 18 month period, working in this dynamic field as you would all expect not only investigating sequencing and laboratory, but also the epidemiology, as well as international approaches uh, to understanding uh, the sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. The conclusion of which was a report that was published in 21, but before they got to there, there was lots of reiterative reports and updates provided, and the team also complementary report on SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern in 2021. Uh, they didn't stop there. The science team immediately were asked to then do complete the work on viral hemorrhagic fevers, which they did, and then proceeded to do uh, further work on sequencing for antimicrobial resistance surveillance, and then finishing off last year with near patient pathogen sequencing. So quite a steady stream that kept our science team very busy. The Wing Foundation, apart from also, uh, funding uh, this, our collaboration with the Center for Medical Ethics and Law at the Hong Kong University, 
also funds us to do horizon scanning policy briefings. Um, Health Action International, uh, which is a charity based in Holland, approached us at the end of last year to undertake a review and research in the, in the field of diagnostics to address antimicrobial resistance. And we're currently very pleased to be uh, working with colleagues at the University of Hong Kong School of Public Health, evaluating the Hong Kong Genome Project. We also produce academic papers, and we have also delivered a number of other projects which are not yet in the public domain. And also, I'm very pleased to say a number of staff are also members of local and national committees, working groups, and we also provide a very popular digital newsletter. Impact. This is a question I'm asked often, and I'm only going to give uh, two very quick examples. Firstly, um, Laura Blackburn, our head of science, uh, as part of our horizon scanning work in 2018, produced a uh, policy briefing on RNA vaccines, not realizing at the time that it was probably going to break all records uh, for us in terms of being the most popular in terms of views and downloads during the pandemic. And it was actually picked up uh, by um, media outlets all over the globe. It was also very interesting for the foundation. The, the pandemic uh, raised the profile of the foundation through its website considerably we got a, a sort of exponential increase in downloads and access and users uh, during the pandemic, which is, to a certain extent, being sustained. We were also uh, delighted to be acknowledged by the Department for Health and Social Care in their uh, Genome UK implementation plan for England for the work that we've done on polygenic scores. So what are we doing at the moment? Well, You'll not be surprised to hear that we continue to be interested in the field of clinical genomics and all the developments that have occurred. Indeed, we are actually reviewing and updating our clinical genomics briefings. Uh, we're doing further work in, uh, in the area of circulating tumor DNA, and we're also going to start uh, a new project on the approaches for the feedback of additional findings. Uh, pathogen genomics remains a continuing interest. Polygenic Scores is also uh, a work program that's continuing. We actually have our next report nearly ready, uh, which is investigating polygenic scores and specifically with reference to clinical validity in terms of how to measure that and also how what sort of evidence would be required for that purpose. And that report will be available at the end of May. And we also have a pipeline of a number of policy briefings specifically on polygenic scores uh, planned for later this year. The legal and regulatory analysis, this is taken, undertaken by the humanities team, and, and, and it's a constant uh, horizon scanning and monitoring and keeping up to date on all the regulation changes that have occurred, not only in the UK, but also the EU, and particularly in the areas of uh, regulation of data, uh, medical devices, and in vitro diagnostics. We also have continuing focus on ethical issues associated with specific areas of genomics and new technologies. And a new project that we'll be starting soon is looking at the legal and ethical framework governing familial <laughs> genomic information. We have nearly completed a project on host genomics in response to infectious diseases, and we will be producing a report later in the year on that, and also in the field of environmental human genomics. So what next? Well, I would like to emphasize that it's a really positive challenge we have at the foundation. There is a wealth of different areas, different topics, different policy challenges that we could look at, but we're really constrained by the capacity and our resources. Therefore, we do take quite a bit of time and take advice from external stakeholders and, and colleagues and experts like yourselves to find out where we can really provide the greatest value, where perhaps there's an under investigation or there's lack of policy attention in a particular area where we could actually help by raising it um, through our efforts. And we'd be delighted to hear from you if you have any suggestions, thoughts. There are some cards in your, in your bags. You can use that. It's, I know it's not for that purpose. It's for, it's for other purposes. But you can leave us a message if you so wish. But if you want to approach one of the PhD staff, please do. And we're really, you know, looking also forward for opportunities of working in collaboration, but also commissioned work. And for all the projects that I've just outlined, there are members of staff here today who know it intimately well, who know the detail, who've actually done the work. So if you do want to speak to someone, let us know, and we'll put you in contact either today or in the future. So do let us know. Right. I consider this the most important slide. 
I would like to acknowledge and thank the current team who are shown on the, on the slide, but actually here in person as well, for all their work on successfully delivering the work program. And gosh, it has been in challenging circumstances during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I would have to say that our work program actually continued at pace during pandemic. I would also like to acknowledge the contributions and thank former members of staff who've joined us today. And I, I say at a personal level, it's been an absolute privilege to lead such an expert and hardworking multidisciplinary team. But I would also like to uh, add that I, we're also supported in our work and in achieving our goals by a bedrock of expert advice and guidance from trustees, senior fellows, fellows and associates, and we're most grateful for them. But also importantly, you. Many of you have worked with us during the last five years on various uh, projects, and really, without you, we wouldn't have achieved the standards or the quality of the work that we have done. It just leaves me to thank Roche for their very generous support for the conference today, uh, without which we couldn't have you here. And that's it. Thank you for me.